Good morning, church. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am saved. life alone but we have the creator the almighty savior right next to us church hallelujah thank you jesus father we pray your hand on this service we're going to give you all the praise and glory and honor this morning lord it all belongs to you use us with your vessels father touch us one by one we need you lord we need you father hallelujah in your name we pray Amen.
soul is satisfied. Oh, Jesus. Only you can satisfy our souls. Hallelujah. Let me hear you, church. Only Jesus can satisfy our souls. Thank you, Lord.
so be it. It all ends with you, my God. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And as we sang this morning, you satisfy our soul, Lord, for you satisfied the Father's perfect will of redemption, O God, and in you we have eternal life. Our souls are satisfied. You fill us, Lord. You fill us with your Spirit, O God, and we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise as your children adopted into your family as sons and daughters we thank you this morning you are jehovah nisi you are the banner that goes before us lord and you fight every battle man may think he's winning lord god but you sit on the throne and scoff for your plan eternal plan is perfect and we look forward to its fulfillment oh god so lord be amongst us this morning Be amongst your church around the world this morning. Manifest your presence as we worship you and praise you and glorify you. And Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We pray that you are glorified in the rest of our service. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Good to see so many faces out there. Some new faces. Hello, Tom. Welcome back to the show. Uh, We got some new faces out there. We welcome you this morning. But uh, as we do, um, after our worship, we do have so many prayer requests. And we just want to bring them before the Lord this morning. Uh, I don't know if you received the email yesterday, but um, Jane Vaughn's brother's daughter-in-law, Kelly, she's 32, had a brain aneurysm. As of right now, she's still in a coma, Jane. She had surgery. She's in a coma. We want to pray for her. And um, is Maribel here? Her supervisor, Dawn, um, is battling some emotional issues with everything that's going on in her world. So I called her, and I, I, you know, and I'm willing to meet with her. So we'll lift her up in prayer. And then, uh, again, with the email, my brother James is um, he's just failing. The cancer's got him. Um, I pray it comes to salvation faith. Uh, I talked to my sister-in-law, who's the daughter of, of a Baptist pastor, and I'm like, you got to speak to him. My oldest brother and I have spoken to him. I pray for a healing, but I pray for a greater healing, a spiritual healing. And my son Robbie and my brother Richard are also battling COVID, so I want to lift them up in prayer. And then uh, Christina, 
praise the Lord, traveled down to Florida to see a family. So it's good. We want to pray for traveling mercies there and other people who are traveling. Marie and Barry traveled down to Florida. Also pray for Anna and others who are battling cancer this, today. They're getting to their last treatment, so we want to pray that God will just remove the cancers. And then Brother Ray, I spoke with him yesterday. He's still this, uh, whatever happened with the accident and the nerve damage, he can't get a good night's sleep. He's exhausted. He wants to be here, but he, he's embarrassed if he should pass out, basically, from being exhausted. And also, we want to pray for Lynette's family. The stomach flu has hit their home, so the kids were vomiting, and she was vomiting, and we were like, oh, you can stay home today. That's fine. Those things spread like wildfire. And then, um, oh, uh, Brother Ryan, um, he goes tomorrow, and they do a procedure on his back to help the mobility in his arthritis, so he's going tomorrow. I want to lift him up in prayer. And also, you know, we see what's going on. Keep the persecuted church in prayer. We're seeing some things, but man, what happened in uh, Afghanistan, what happens like in northern Nigeria, the Sudan, and, and areas of Muslim countries around the world, the communist countries, our brothers and sisters are being persecuted, tortured, violated, martyred. So we just want to pray for them. Amen? Uh, we don't know if it could or will come our way, but um, they're staying the faith because they believe in the one. Amen. <laughs> And also, uh, we want to pray for workers that are making a choice and they're being let go from their jobs because of a personal choice. And as I said before, the party that says, my body, my choice, doesn't agree when it comes to putting a vaccine in your body or an inoculation. I, I won't call it a vaccine. Um, so we want to pray for them also that God will do a miracle and meet their needs. And uh, if you watch J.D. Farag, he had numerous uh, but God stories of, of things that went the way of the Christian to, to retain their position. So we'll just keep praying. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come this morning and we come in the authority of Jesus' name. And we ask, Lord, my God, that you would minister to the request you've already heard and the secret desires of our hearts. Lord, we pray for Kelly and we ask that you would do a miracle that all the doctors could say is something miraculous happened here. And Jane could share with her brother who could share that it was through Christ Jesus that this girl was healed. Minister to her, we pray today, Lord. And as she comes out of the coma, Lord, we pray that she is 100% complete, fine. And Lord, we also pray for this woman, Dawn, who is battling these emotional issues from a marriage, from everything that's going on today. And also others, Lord, these teenage girls that are, we've lifted up in prayer. I want to mention them by name for privacy's sake, but that are wrestling with the depressions and the anxieties that come from the age that we live in, where their social time is reduced and things all around them just look so bleak. So we pray, my God, that you would minister to any who are wrestling with emotional issues, anxieties, fears, whatever it may be, my God, that you would comfort their hearts and their minds and their souls. And Lord, the real answer is you. The real answer is you and the peace we can find in you and the hope that we have in you. So minister, Lord, we pray. And Lord, we do lift up those battling cancer. Thank you that Christina was well enough to go down to Florida to see a family, see a home safe, bless her time there, my God, and eradicate the cancer from her body. And also for Anna, as she has her last treatment coming up, just be with her and Pete. And minister to Pete's knee, as you know his job in the shop, Lord, and the arthritis he has in his knee, he needs to work. So watch over them as a family, minister to their children. And as Jason's with us, we thank you, Lord, continue to minister to Jason. Bless his abilities in school, Lord, that he would just do so well. And we thank you, Lord, that his sister Lauren has seen uh, some specialists. We pray that it all work out, that she can get the surgeries that she needs. Minister to her, we ask, Lord. And Father, for all those battling cancer, as I see Sean with us today, Lord, that you continue to touch him. Randy's brother David, others, Lord, that we have in our congregation, keep them cancer-free. And Father, for Brother Ray, we ask that you do a miracle as he today, Lord, looks to your word and will begin a fast, starting to fast every day. So to hear from you and that you would work through this time alone with him, Lord God, and he with you, that you would heal him and he would get the rest that he needs. And Lord God, for the Pelta family, we just ask that that stomach virus would make its way through quickly that you get mom and dad back healthy and the children. And we pray for Brian, that you would watch over his work, Lord, with the ultimatum that he had to make. 
and he made the choice that best suits him, Lord. So we just ask that you would watch over him. And all the other workers, Lord, that are making the choice not to get inoculated and are losing their jobs, I pray that you would watch over them and meet their needs. Father God, and just we want to hear some but God stories, how you intervene, Lord. And Father, for the persecuted church, Lord God, be with our brothers and sisters. Minister to them that are facing such hardship, martyrdom, imprisonment, because they proclaim your name and will not deny your name. And Lord, what I ask is that you would pour out your grace in them through these tests and trials. Deliver those you choose to deliver, my God, but use it as a testimony to their persecutors that they would come to salvation faith. Almighty God, watch over your people. And Lord, I do pray for my brother James. Open up his heart. Open up his heart. And for all our unsaved loved ones, our children, Lord, that are not walking with you, our siblings, Lord, our grandchildren. But Lord God, let us be the witnesses to those in our workplace whose other family is praying for them, that a laborer will be amongst them to speak the gospel. Lord, use us to share the gospel of salvation. Bring our unsaved loved ones to the truth, Lord. Many have heard it and have walked away. So, Lord, we just ask, give us the desires of our heart, which is to see our family saved. My God, and again, use us. Use us. Empower us, Holy Spirit. Give us the words to speak. And, Lord God, again, for those who are traveling, see them home safely. Bless their trip and protect them, Lord. And, Father, again, we ask that you would be with us in the rest of the service. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. There's a lot of prayer requests out there, church, but we just keep praying. Amen? Uh, and on that note, let me explain what we're doing. Um, obviously, we have Monday night prayer, but in the children's church area at 9.15-ish to a quarter to 10, I got some soft piano music going. If you want to come in and prepare your hearts for service, because we'd like to come in readied up to worship, not just bouncing out of the car, craziness, and then whoa! But We'll open that. And then after service, and this is from a dear sister who uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing when you guys speak to me, Danny's going to come up and play a little bit. And if you could just quietly exit. We have the vestibule. We have the back where you guys can talk. But the front will be open if you want to come up and pray and just seek the Lord. I mean, if the sermon touches your heart, if there's something you want to be prayed for, elders, some of our prayer warriors who stay behind, we'd just like to open the front so that you can come up and pray and seek God. So it is a time for the church to really be seeking our Lord. Amen? So with that said, Carlos, is he here this morning? No, he's taken off for his birthday. So wish Carlos a happy birthday when you see him. And are the couriers here? Little Samuel, it's his birthday, so wish him a happy birthday when you see them. And then Sal and Michelle, if you can come forward. Where is Michelle? Come on up. Come on up here. I don't know what I do with my stuff. Sal, did you take my book? And I'm like, you know, I'm losing my mind, but I didn't think it was that bad. All right, but if they come up, it's their anniversary Wednesday. So we just want to pray for them. And if you stand up, Miss Mia, look at Mia. She had the scoliosis surgery. Look how beautiful she looks. When the parents told her to straighten up, they weren't kidding. <laughs> but we want to just wish you from the church a very happy anniversary. You are a blessing with all you do, and we just we thank you and we love you. Amen. Thank you. Thank so you. let's just thank you. Thank you. So let's just pray. Father, bless this couple. You know the uh, desires of their heart for Aiden and Mia that you would watch over them, that you would meet all their needs. And Lord, we've seen you work in and through their lives. You've seen the mountain after mountain after mountain that they have had to climb. Father, bless them and be with them as they do your will and your work. And Lord, we thank you and we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I escaped right. 19 years. You didn't ask. Oh. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and it seems like only yesterday. You know what a lousy day yesterday was. <laughs> no. Uh, on that note, we got a prayer and praise Monday night. Men's group. Yes, Tim. In uh, Copake and available via Zoom. Wednesday is Bible study. Come on out. Mike's uh, going to reiterate some things we talk about today. And then next week, we kick it off all again. And it is Mission Sunday. Thank God for those people who go into these countries and are preaching the gospel. There's a lot of stuff going on around the world. Amen? 
So on that note, I'm going to release our little ones to Kinder Church and Children's Church. And again, thank you, Brother Tim and Donna, for what you do with our children. So you guys are released. And they keep moving everything. I'll use tape. That'll work. They say duct tape works for anything. Praise God. So once the kitties are removed, we can open up in prayer and get on with the sermon. Praise God. Oh, Helen, it's so good to see you. Oh, wow. Praise the Lord. Okay. All right. Let's open in prayer. Um, Antoinette, when they leave, can you shut the back door, please? Thank you. Father, again, just open our hearts to your word today. This was a blessing study to do, and I, Lord, I feel privileged that I can bring this message of hope to your church. Please open our hearts, open our minds, and I pray your anointing Holy Spirit that I would do justice to your word, and we just give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So this morning, we'll be making a transition, if you will, from our study, within our study of the book of Revelation. And to understand our procession forward, we have to take a step back and revisit the overall structure of the book itself. In chapter 1, verse 19, the Lord Jesus gives insight into how the words of the book of Revelation are going to proceed. As he says this in, in, chapter 19, in verse 19 of chapter 1, Write, therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. So in this statement, we see the three divisions of the book of Revelation itself. The first division involves a vision of the Lord Jesus, as he states and writes this, what you have seen, referring to chapter 1, when we get a vision of the resurrected and glorified Lord Jesus Christ. And this is really important to the first century church because we must remember that they're being persecuted. They're under severe persecution in some areas. And here they get a vision of the glorified, the resurrected, the ascended Lord Jesus Christ. He's no longer the man on the cross. He's the man who sits at the right hand, or the God man who sits at the right hand of the Father in all majesty and beauty. Amen? So we can understand even for us no matter what's going on in this world that's who we serve a resurrected glorified living God who can empathize with our weaknesses amen so praise God so he gives him this vision that's what was and to go on the second division is where the Lord instructs John to write to the seven churches and he writes this write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And in chapters 2 and 3, we actually read of the commendations and the rebukes that he has for these seven historical churches. And as I've said before, these churches and the folks within them represent all the churches and individuals throughout the church age. In some churches, there can be Laodiceans. In the same church, there can be Philadelphians. But it's a message to those churches. That's what is. That's what John was writing to at that moment. And so in this morning, we're going to actually come to our last division of the book, and it's the prophetic vision given to John and all believers concerning what is to come, what is to occur, the post-church age, if you will. Hang on to that. And this is where we're going to camp for several months, not on this message, but on the rest of the book of Revelation, because now it's going to speak to the post-church age, and isn't it interesting that most of what we're going to speak to doesn't even apply to us. But the Lord says, read and understand. Why? For our edification and also so we can share with others what is to come. And that through that, hopefully they will come to faith seeing the judgment that's going to come on a Christ-rejecting world. So with that said, what I'd like you to do is open up to Revelation chapter 4. And I do want to read verses 1 to 11, because we're really only going to refer to two verses in there this morning, but we'll read it in its entirety, okay? Revelation 4, 1 to 11. After these things, keep that in mind, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, 
like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me and said, come up here and I will show you now what must take place after these things. I'm emphasizing for a reason. Immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne and he, and he who was sitting was like Jasper and Sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne there were 24 thrones. And upon them, on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns were on their heads. Out of the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire before, before fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second like a calf. The third creature had the face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings and full of eyes, around and within, and day and night, listen to what they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits at the throne, and they will worship him forever and ever, and they will cast their crowns before him, saying, worthy are you, Lord, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because you, of your will they existence and were created. Praise the Lord. That's the vision John sees. Wow. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? And church, listen, the opening words are very important. Listen again. After these things. And the question you must ask is, after what things? Well, the things that John had just seen. The vision of Christ and what? The explanation to the churches, the commendations and rebukes. So he saw the Lord. Now came the discussion to the churches. So after these things, now Jesus will move forward. Do you see that? They just saw this and now it's the, what we're going to see is the eschatological timeline moving forward past the church age, if you will. And as we'll see from Scripture, that the completion of the church age, the church and the body of believers is now translated into heaven. And it's what we, the church, often call the rapture because the church age is complete and now eschatologically we're moving forward into the tribulation period where the church will not be. Amen? Oh, boy. If you want to be here for the tribulation, that's fine with me. I'm going. All right, so as we proceed through the following chapters, we have to understand that through Revelation, there will be symbolic and apocalyptic language. And it's used to represent or reveal a spiritual truth. So we must wade through these and discern, listen carefully, properly and systematically and biblically. All right, so we have to really take our time through this to understand it. So with that said, John looks and a door was open in heaven. And when he uses this terminology, what he's speaking to is looking into the third heaven, the place where God resides. And if we look in scripture, the, the first heaven is our atmosphere. The second heaven is the stars and the galaxies. But the third heaven is where God himself abides. Okay, so this is where John is taken. And let me just give you some examples from scripture. In Ezekiel uh, chapter 1, verse 1, of his book, it says this, Ezekiel speaking. In my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kabar River, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. In other words, he saw the third heaven. He saw the visions of Almighty God where, uh, where God dwelt. And in Matthew 3.16, it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove lighting on him. Again, the third heaven, as he sees the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus when he was baptized. But this next passage is one I absolutely love. Absolutely love. First, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 and 4. This is Paul. He says, I know a man. Sounds like you, TJ. I know a guy. I know a man in Christ 
who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. Ready? Was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. When Paul gets up into the third heaven, he's seeing glory. He can't even express in human words what he sees. They're inexpressible to the human mind and the finite mind. Heaven is beyond our comprehension, church. It's going to be glorious. Glorious. And church, this is where John finds himself. And he will write of these inexpressible things for our benefit and the benefit of all born-again believers throughout the church age. This is for our benefit. Amen? In Daniel, when he sees the 70-week prophecy and the end times prophecy, what does the Lord say to him? Close it up. Shut it up. This is for the end times. But here, John is saying, write and let the church read. Why? Because the end has come. The end has come. So he's saying, write it down and let the church be aware that I'm coming soon. And the voice that speaks to him is referred to in the same manner as in chapter 1, verse 10 where John writes, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And from Scripture we know that this is the Lord Jesus himself. So again, it's the Lord who's speaking to John. He's saying, this is what was, this is what is the church age. Now write down what is to come. And church, the first words of Christ are very important. Listen again. Come up here and I will show you what must must take place after these things, after the vision you saw of me and after the church age. Now let me show you what's going to take place. Amen? And the question is, okay. John, John was commanded to come up to the third heaven. After the Lord addresses the churches, and the Lord will move on in prophetic discussion of what will occur after the church age is over. And the question is, why? What happened to the church so that the Lord no, is, no longer speaks to it? And the answer is this, because the church, the true body of Christ, born-again believers, are no longer on earth, but have been translated or raptured into glory. We're no longer here. That's why the Lord doesn't address the church there. He's going to speak to it here, if you will, okay? Okay. Family, from chapter 4, listen carefully, and I'm going to read a lot this morning, until chapters 19 to 22. We no longer hear of the bride of Christ, Christ's church, or the term church itself. It is not seen between chapters 4 and chapter 19. Never spoken about. And the reason being, as we'll see, is that between chapters 1 and 3, and then 19 to 22, the Lord is speaking to a Christ-rejecting world. And he's also speaking to the Israelites in order to prepare them to receive their Messiah once and for all. He is not speaking to the church any longer. Do we understand that? We have been translated. He's not speaking or addressing the body of believers who have come through salvation faith into the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether dead or alive, all born-again believers from the beginning of the church age will be translated and taken to heaven. Amen? Amen. And what I'd like to do now is uh, take some time to discuss this blessed hope in context within the words that were spoken to John in this portion of Scripture. I really want to look at the rapture this morning. So the Lord says to the apostle, come up here. Then we find John in the spirit before the Lord, and there are two things that we can glean from this. The first is this. It's the timing. The timing, hang on to that, of this event that is sandwiched between the church age and the tribulation, okay? The second, oh, hold on, and listen carefully. The scriptures often make reference to things in the form of a type. So what we see here is somewhat of a typology. And a typology is a, a picture of a person, place, or thing foreshadowing something that's going to happen to a person, place, or thing in the future. So we can actually glean from this that this is in a way a typology. When John is told to come up here, at some point, we're going to hear the same thing, a trumpet, etc., and the Lord's going to say, come, and we will come. Amen? Up into glory. 
And so this is a type, if you will. And the best example I can give you of a typology is if we look in Scripture, is the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. If you go from Adam, who was covered with the shed blood of an animal, to the Levitical offerings, burnt offering, uh, guilt offering, sin offering, Passover, the shedding of blood, to what? The Day of Atonement, shedding of blood, all pointing to the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. So these, this is an example of a typology in Scripture. So we can look at John, in a sense, as a type when he's saying, come up here, because it will be between what? The church age and the tribulation. All righty? And if we go back in Scripture, um, you'll see all types of types throughout the Scripture, okay? But more importantly than this typology is the support, listen to me, of the chronology of events that points to the fact that the church will not be present for what the Lord is going to speak to from chapter 4 on. And what do I mean? The Lord addresses the churches. John is then told, come up hither. And then the Lord will speak to what's going to happen in the tribulation period. Got it? Quiet back there. And look, there are many different types in the Old Testament that point to a pre-tribulation rapture. We believe in this church and as an assemblies as a pre-tribulation rapture, that we will be removed before the tribulation begins. And I'd like to go through these. I'd like to go through these just, just for, our, you know, edification. And the first one we see in Scripture is in chapter 5 of Genesis, Enoch. So listen to uh, Genesis 5, 21 to 24. Enoch lived 65 years, became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. And he had other sons and daughters. So all the deeds of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. All righty? And family, what we have to notice here in, in, verse, in chapter 5 of Genesis, read it. This one lived, he died. This one lived, he died. This one lived, he died. My mother used to use Methuselah. She said he's as old as Methuselah, 969. Oh, my God, that's a long time. All right? But they all died. We get to Enoch, he's taken away by God. You don't see that he dies. Listen to Hebrews 11.5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up for he attained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And as we go forward in his lineage, we see Noah as one of his descendants. And it's interesting that Noah also was seen as blameless because he walked by faith in God. I was sharing with Chris and Alana. He built an ark. Could you imagine? No rain, middle of dry ground. He hears the voice of God and says, build a 450-foot ship that's four stories tall. Right. All right, but he does it because he believed by faith the word of God that God said he was going to bring a judgment. And you know what his name means? His name means the one who will bring comfort. And why we could say that Noah will bring comfort because only him and seven others in his family made it through God's judgment. But through Noah, if you follow his lineage all the way down, Jesus' lineage can be traced back to Noah. Do you understand? So how did Noah bring comfort? Because from him, the one would come who would bring comfort to the world through his redemptive work on the cross. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And to go on, we see another type in the life of Daniel. Remember when Daniel, he's there, he's taken into exile, and he's put in a pretty precarious situation as King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He won't tell it to his magicians or soothsayers. He says, tell me the dream and interpret it. He, and they can't do it. They, can't, it's just, they say this is impossible. So he's going to kill all the magicians and soothsayers, etc. So Daniel comes in, and by the grace of God, he interprets the dream and tells Nebuchadnezzar his dream. And Nebuchadnezzar is like, wow, this person has the spirit of the living gods in him. Yes? So we have the story. And what happens? Daniel is placed in a high position in Babylon. He's made like second in rule and ruler of all the soothsayers and magicians. So here's Daniel. And listen to uh, Daniel chapter 2, verses 47 to 48. 
The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed David in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. But now as we come to chapter 3, what do we see? Daniel is in that nice golden city of Babylon and everybody else is called to gather, to bow down to the image of the beast. I mean the image of Nebuchadnezzar. All right? And there are three Jewish boys who will not bow down. They are a symbol of the Jewish community during the tribulation, those who are going to remain faithful. They are thrown into the furnace, but there's one like the son of the gods walking along with them. All right? And listen, where this furnace was built was 15 to 16 miles on the plain of Dura, east of Babylon. Daniel is here, and he's not subject to the king's judgment when those Jews go through the fire, a typology that the Lord's faithful will not see the judgment of God. Amen. Amen? It's a typology, if you will. So, again, for our education this morning, and even before we get to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, we need to look at something right here. And this was brought to my light by studying commentaries and pray for me as I go through this. I'm going to go through it slowly because it, it blew my mind. In John 14, 16 to 18, we have the words of the Lord concerning the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the church. Listen to what it says. I will ask the Father, and he will give you an, another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as often as I will come to you. And his... The Holy Spirit's job is to do what? Throughout the church age, to convict, and upon conviction, if someone responds, convert, and then to sanctify the unbeliever into becoming a believing saint, or I should say the believer as we make our walk through this life. The other purpose is the Holy Spirit is used to what? Convict unbelievers to come to faith. So that's his position, his job here on earth during the church age. Now, if we jump to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, follow me here. We are told that the day of the Lord, the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation will not come. The presentation of the Antichrist will not come until the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. Do you see that? Right now, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, born-again believers. He's convicting unbelievers of sin, that they would come to salvation. But here in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, we see it's saying there's coming time before the Antichrist, before the tribulation, the restraint of the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way. Now, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 3, listen to what it says. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered to him, that's the rapture of believers, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching or allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. He's saying to these believers, the day of the Lord has not come. You're not going to be part of it. So he's trying to ease their fears. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Now listen to verses 6 to 7. And now you know what is holding him back so that it may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. No, yes, it's all over. But the one, the Holy Spirit, who holds it back will continue to do so until he, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. So the Antichrist will not be revealed. The lawless one will not be revealed. The tribulation will not begin until the restrainer is taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit. So a question we have to ask ourselves, where does the Holy Spirit reside now during the church age? He's omnipresent. We know that God is omnipresent, but he dwells within the believer. He dwells within us, yes? Therefore, if he, the Holy Spirit, is to be removed before the day of the Lord, before the tribulation period, 
before the man of lawlessness is revealed, then who has to be removed with him? Hello? Us! The church. Now here comes the challenging part. And this, this is what, it was a wonderful study. Look at Revelation 4, verse 5, where John is before the throne. And it says this, Out from the throne come flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Indicating, listen, that the restrainer has been removed and now is before the throne of the Father with the Son. And the Spirit of God is in heaven. Then those in whom he dwelled must be in heaven also. Because if he pulls back and goes back to heaven, we're not going to be left unregenerated, unborn again. We are going to go with him into the throne room. Amen? Now again, we know God is omnipresent. The Spirit will be at work during the tribulation period. But listen to this. In all the epistles, not the Gospels, we see the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son and Jesus' baptism, etc. But in all the epistles, there's only one time that the Lord invokes all three names. And that's in uh, 2 Corinthians 13 and 14 when he gives a blessing. The Trinity is not mentioned together in any of the epistles. Because Jesus has ascended and is at the right hand of the Father, and the Father is in heaven. But now, in Revelation, we see that the Holy Spirit is before the throne. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are together. Therefore, guess who's with the Holy Spirit? Those that he dwelt within, the body of Christ, born-again believers. Hallelujah. We will be in heaven. We will be in glory. There is so much in Scripture pointing to a pre-tribulation rapture. And I was recently with a, a pastor, and he's like, I'm not sure. Are we in, in the beginning of the tribulation? And I said, no, we will not be here. We may suffer man's persecution, but we will not be here for the tribulation. Do you hear me? Praise God. So with that said, let's go to our very familiar passage about the rapture. And it's in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, and most of us are familiar with it, and it reads this. This is Paul writing. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, those who have died, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be with the Lord forever. Therefore, pointing back to what he just said, comfort, encourage each other, with these words. Church, we're a people that will be translated at some point into the presence of God. What a hope. What a blessing. Many of us come from backgrounds, walks, that we, none of us deserve to stand before the Lord. But because of his mercy and his redemptive work, we have salvation. And family, this event is what's known in the church language as the rapture or the blessed hope. But let me tell you, the word rapture is never seen in the scriptures. Uh huh? Yes, it's never seen. But this word that we see, that we use in our circumstances and call this the rapture, is from the Latin root word rapturo, which means caught up. The, verse that we, the word that we see in the verses here, it means caught up. And in the original Greek Septuagint, it's the word hapazo, which also means caught up. What it's pointing to is that we will be caught up. We will be snatched away at this point and brought into the presence of God. Hallelujah. And let's just uh, look at a couple of other verses pertaining to this event. The very familiar one, John 14, 1 to 3. Listen to what it says. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. This is Jesus speaking. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Praise God. Not the fires of Hades or the fires of hell, but the presence of Almighty God. That's our future. And listen to this in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. A lot of scripture verse today. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I told you a mystery. Hang on to that. We will not all sleep. We will not all die. But we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. Praise God. And we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and the mortal must put on immortality. But when, the perish, when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come this, about the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, because it points to us being sinful. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Therefore, my beloved, brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. Let's be steadfast and immovable, church. We see what's going on. But let's be about the Lord's business, sharing the gospel, edifying each other, fellowshipping together, preparing ourselves for the Lord's return. And let me uh, stop here and make some important points about this event. First of all, Paul says this is a mystery. Why is it a mystery? Because it was hidden in the pages of the Old Testament, but now we are privy. We have the understanding of what God is saying here, that there's going to come a day for my born-again believers that are going to be translated into my presence. It's been revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. And we know these things. We can be encouraged by it, that he's coming to get us. Second, we're going to be changed in a sense that we will now receive glorified and resurrected bodies and we will be like Christ. Listen to 1 John 3, 1 to, th uh, 1 to 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. We are sons and daughters of the living God. Amen. Amen? Not to be haughty, but praise the Lord. Amen? The reason the world does not know us, it didn't know him. Don't be surprised at the mocking, the persecution, the teasing. They don't know him. They don't know the truth. And there's going to be a great deception in these last days. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in, in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The curse of sin done away with. Come on, guys. Body's no longer subject to decay. I was sharing with Joanne and Dottie. There's a great T-shirt. Two of them, actually. One says, if I woke up this morning and wasn't in pain, I think I was dead. The other says, sons of arthritis, ibuprofen chapter. <laughs> think about it. Washed and waxed the car yesterday. I thought my shoulder was going to fall off. It was amazing. It's like, what happened? But think. New bodies, hearts and mind, this is even better. No longer subject to sin. Can you imagine? No thought, no word, no attitude. You know? Come on. No longer subject to sin. And we'll be holy as he is, holy in the sense as he is holy, even though he's separate from all things. And I put down here, as the song says, I can only imagine. And I really can't, because in this finite mind, we can't imagine heaven. That's why Paul said it's inexpressible. Amen? Third, we never, ever, ever have to experience the wrath of God. Never have to experience it. Because, listen, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, after the talk of the rapture, comes 1 Thessalonians 5. Brilliant, right? And we're told, in, listen to verses 1 to 11 in Thessalonians 5, um, chapter 5. 
Now as the time and epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves full know that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the knife. night. Hang on to that. There's no, uh, like leading up to, Jesus is just going to come for his bride. Amen? The idea is to be ready, to be the virgins who had the five lamps of oil filled and ready to meet the bridegroom. Gabish? While they are saying peace and safety, then will destruction come upon them suddenly like labor pains. Upon a woman with child, they will not escape. Who won't escape? You ready? The unsaved. Those who sit in church and profess salvation but really don't possess salvation, they're not born again. Those who rely on religious affiliations, rituals, or good works as a way of achieving righteousness. No one can achieve righteousness in their own sake. It only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. And they will not escape the day of the Lord. Let's go on to verse 4. But you, brethren, born-again believers, are not in darkness, that the day will overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor the darkness. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. In other words, we see things happening. Be alert. Be sober. Be prepared for the Lord's coming. Amen? Amen? But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Ready? For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So whether we are awake, alive, or asleep, dead, we will be together with him. Last verse. Therefore, encourage each other. Build up one another, just as you were doing. Family of God, be encouraged this morning. That's what I'm trying to do, is be encouraged. The Lord is coming back for his church. And we will be part of that. New bodies, new minds, never to sin again. And we'll be in his presence forever. Do you think you're going to remember any of this garbage of earth? Absolutely not. When you look upon the Savior and you melt in love, oh my Lord, it's going to be glorious. And to conclude this morning, I want to leave you with two last considerations. And the first that we glean from is found in Matthew 24, 32 to 34. The parable of the fig tree. And before I read it, I want to say this. No man knows the day or the hour that Jesus is coming. But we have some insight from Christ himself that says, when you see certain things, wake up, wake up. So look at this. Matthew 24, 32 to 34. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and puts on its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Listen, the fig tree is a symbol of Israel. Its leaves became t tender and the leaves started to come out in 1948. After almost 2,000 years, Israel became a nation again. And its not, leaves are no longer tender. They have produced fruit. It's a thriving nation. So if Jesus is saying, when you see it first leaf, you know that summer is near. How about when it has fruit on the tree? You know you're real close, right? And the second consideration is this. When we see the signs of all that's going on, all that's happening geopolitically, do you know I was watching from the diner on Saturday, 158 nations signed a global corporate tax. Do you hear me? So you can't move anywhere as a corporation, you'll be taxed by the global, by the global tax agency, if you will. So geopolitically, we see things happening, okay? How about geologically? The number of earthquakes, come on now, hurricanes, all these natural disasters that are increasing in frequency and magnitude. How about geopolitically? Never, never have we seen where Turkey, Iran, and Russia have made a pact. Three of the major players in the Ezekiel War. They hate each other. The Sunnis hate the Shiites, the Shiites hate the Sunnis, and Russia hates them both. But they made a pact, because at some point they'll go for the spoil in Israel. And Afghanistan, 
I know we're all heart sick. How'd it happen? It's part of the land of Magog, that area in Ezekiel that will what? Support Russia and come against Israel. It's happening. It's happening now. Amen? And how about technologically? And I'm not getting political, but in the inoculation, it's not, it's not the mark of the beast. Let's get that down. This shot is not the mark of the beast, but it's a precursor, a step to, because sooner or later, since they want to track everybody, I mean, the prime minister in Australia was very plain when she said, uh, oh, we have to track people. This is how it's going to be in the new world order. They're not hiding it. So they're going to come up with a system to track everybody. Hello. Hello. So the technology is already in place. They've used it in some of the uh, countries in uh, northern Europe. So it's there. So we see everything in place, if you will. These are the signs that are before us. And what does it say? Listen to this. In Luke 21, 28, but when these things begin to take place, listen carefully, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Israel's a nation. Everything happened geopolitically, geologically, technologically, all pointing to the signs that things are happening and the Lord is coming soon. Amen? So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. What kind of people ought we to be as believers and what should be our focus? First of all, I love that line at the end of the scripture. Let us lift up our heads, not be downcast and discouraged over what's going on. I'm trying, I'm purposing, but it just seems to come up. I don't want to get together with my fellow believers and talk about all the garbage out there. Yes, it's getting hard. It's getting tough. The mandates are getting tighter and tighter. But let's lift up our heads and be encouraged that it's only pointing to our Lord coming back soon. Rejoice. Rejoice. Don't be downcast. He's coming back, and we're seeing the signs of his imminent return every day. There has to be a generation that will be raptured. Why not this one? Why not? Everything is in place. Or do we think it's really out there that, oh yeah, the rapture. Even when I was talking with Ryan before, I've heard it since 72, but all these things weren't taking place. And they're happening quicker and quicker. And the second thing is, how do we need to live? Listen to 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12. The day of the Lord is going to come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and all its works will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? You ought to conduct yourselves in holiness and godliness as you anticipate and hasten the coming of the day of God. He wants his people to walk in holiness and godliness. Be separate. Holiness means being separated. Separate from the things of the world. All the silly talk of the world and to walk in godliness. Amen? You want to read a good book, even though he's a Calvinist? R.C. Sproul, The Holiness of God. Wow! These last two chapters I went and talk about being convicted. God is holy. He went through uh, John, uh, Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. If I ever preached that sermon, you guys would throw me out of here. He basically told the congregation, if you're not in Christ, you're all going to hell. And then he brought out all these pictures of hell. But people came to faith. People said they felt like their feet were burning while he was preaching. They came to faith. But we need to be living holy and godly lives. Amen? And then Titus 2, 11 to 14, one of my favorites. For the grace of God has appeared, has it not? Has Christ not appeared to and come and brought salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us, from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people his own possession was zealous for God. You know what the end purpose of God has for us on earth? Read Romans 28 and 29. To mold us into the image of his Son, to bear the fruit of the Spirit, to be holy as he is holy. Amen? Are we eagerly awaiting his appearing? Are we looking to be sanctified and like Christ and witnessing and sharing the gospel to a lost world? I don't care who it is. Pray for the president. After reading this part of the book and Sproul's book, you don't want anybody to go to hell. 
It's a constant, 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 constant eternal torment. And who are we? It was for all of us. Because we sinned against the holy God. It was never created for man. It was created for Lucifer and his fallen angels. But we fall into it too because we sinned against the holy God. Anyone, everybody we rub elbows with if they're not in Christ, look at them as being a leper, rotted, and then just going to die a hideous death forever and ever and ever. I don't know how I got onto that. Family, are we ready? Are we prepared? Donning our wedding garments as we await our bridegroom. Are we about his business, the Great Commission? Sharing the gospel. Church family, everything is pointing to the imminent return of Christ. There's going to be a generation that will not see death. I'll say it again. Why not this generation? Why not? So my last question for everyone here today or watching online, are you ready? Are you ready? For the only way to experience the wonderful promise of this rapture, this translation into glory, is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. That is the only way. So if you're here this morning and you have not understood the gospel, if you thought you could get in because you're a good person or some other way, hear me today. That is a lie from the pit of hell. The only way to receive this promise and all the promises of Scripture is by faith in the redemptive work of Christ alone for your salvation. At that point, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You are born of the Spirit, born again. You are marked and sealed that you belong to God, an adopted son and daughter, and when a translation or the rapture occurs, you will go up into glory and be with God. And even if you should pass in this world on the day that trumpet blows, whew, you will get a resurrected body. Amen? And be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Family, his words are yes and amen. His words are yes and amen. This is the truth of God's word. As your pastor, as my pastor before me, and many pastors truly believe in a pre-tribulation rapture based on the scriptures, we aren't going to be here for the 70th week, the tribulation period, okay? So please be encouraged this morning in light of all that we see going on. This could be the generation, and if not, that God would pour out his grace in a time of testing or trial, that we would never deny our Lord, because we will be with him in glory forever. This is our blessed hope. This is the hope of every Christian. So again, if you're not in Christ today, let today be the day of salvation, amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, my God. Lord, we just give you all the glory and we thank you that, Father, you sent your Son into the world, the Holy One, to walk amongst the depraved and sinful so as to be the one who would come and redeem us through the precious work on the cross as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And Father, we thank you also that you drew us in Holy Spirit, that you convicted us and when we responded, you came into our hearts. We are born of your spirit, Lord God. And Father, because of who we are in your Son and the Spirit of God that dwells within us, we are marked and sealed that we belong to you and we can stand on this promise and all your promises that a day will come when, Jesus, you will come to the clouds. The voice of the archangel, the trumpet will blow and you'll say, come up, and we will come up and be with you in glory, receiving resurrected and glorified bodies. And we will spend eternity with you, Lord. And Father, I do pray that each one of us would be a witness of this gospel to the lost. Again, I pray for our unsaved loved ones that they would come into the ark of salvation. Almighty God, we just thank you so much this morning and we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise and we thank you from our heart of hearts for the hope, the hope that we have. The world must decay. The things must go this way. It's written in your word. But Lord, we have a blessed hope and we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So be encouraged this morning, church. Give him the clap offering. Give him the clap offering, not the man. You can
the Lord. Amen. He died for us so that we wouldn't have to suffer the wrath of God. We will not see the wrath of God. Amen. So we just thank the Lord this morning for his finished work and the hope we have in the promises of his word. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He'll be with us forever and we'll be with him forever. Amen. So again, as we dismiss, if you can quietly exit and if anybody wants to come up to the front and pray or needs prayer, leave the front open. We need to seek the Lord, church. There's a lot of lost souls out there, even Christians who are fearful and anxious over everything going on. 
and the peace of Christ, which transcends all understanding, will fill our hearts as we see you. So they're going to lightly play. And again, if you could exit quietly, you can go in the back or even in this vestibule. And if you want to fellowship, I get it. But I'd like to leave the front open for prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the promises we have in you. We thank you, Lord, that you died for us, that you took our place on the cross so we would never have to suffer the wrath of your Father. And that Holy Spirit, you are the deposit, the guarantee of what is to come. Lord, help us to be about your business as we await your return. And Father, help us. Give us the wisdom, the wisdom, Holy Spirit, the words, that we could speak the truth of your gospel to others without fear, but with boldness and love. My God, this morning, I dismiss my brothers and sisters, and Lord, I pray that you would watch over them, hear their prayers, see everyone home safe, my God, and just uh, be with us and use us throughout the week. And Lord, we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor, we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed day, church.